Thank you, Mark, for all that you do to ensure the safety of our schools and to promote a positive school climate. To nominate Mark for this award, staff members and students wrote letters, and we have asked a few of those individuals to share their letters with you. So now I'd like for Ms. Paige Rosati to come up. She's an intervention specialist at Beaver Creek High School. And Jacob Schaub, he is a 12th grader at Beaver Creek High School. And then Sarah Selhammer will come up and read as well. Mark, why don't you come on up so everybody can see you? I'm going to get, get you on camera. My detective skills were a little. It's <laughs> <laughs> not <laughs> picking up on this until I started. A little slow here, but. The Floyd Ledbetter National School Resource Officer of the Year Committee. It is my pleasure to recommend Beaver Creek City School Resource Officer, Officer Mark Brown, for the Floyd Ledbetter National School Resource Officer of the Year Award. Officer Brown has interwoven his high standards into Beaver Creek High School's student body and staff. He is available in the hallway, providing encouragement to students, or being observed having a one-on-one -on -one discussion with a student about a recent accomplishment. Officer Brown is a true friend to his students. I'm a Beaver Creek City Schools cross-categorical intervention specialist at Beaver Creek High School. Some may say I'm an MH teacher. I am also the director of the Beaver Creek High School All-Star Dance Team, a dance team composed of 66 student dancers, half are identified as having severe developmental disabilities, and half are typical peers. Many students on the team are considered at risk for one reason or another. The team is supported by Officer Brown by him being an actual member and dancer of the team, just like everyone else. <laughs> Officer Brown practices with the team every week on Friday evenings beginning October, October through our season, which ends in April. He travels with the team for dance performances throughout Ohio and Kentucky, and his presence on the team is inspiring to neighboring schools. 
Officer Mark Brown's participation on the All-Star Dance Team has sent a message for the BHS student body to accept differences within the school, that individual choices affect everyone, and to be kind to others. Officer Brown is well respected, and he is aware that his actions and responses are being modeled not only by our students, by our community members. My students love Officer Brown for taking his time to spend with them dancing on our team, and the amount of change that this one man has created in our community is much bigger than an officer walking in the hallway. Officer Brown's impact to our school and community through his interactions on the BHS All-Star Dance Team has encouraged others to be good citizens and helpful towards others. He has personal and direct one-on-one -on -one dialogue with the students who he suspects are using drugs, and although he states his disappointment, he encourages good decision-making in the future. He is friends with nearly every student in the school who has a social media account. He likes and commends comments on their successes, and his approval is meaningful to our students. Our students have stated they want Officer Brown to be proud of them. The students at the school consciously try to exhibit behavior that Officer Brown will be proud of. In conclusion, Officer Brown is a remarkable and inspiring individual who deserves recognition for his dedication <coughs> to his profession as a school resource officer. Thank you. is just our school resource officer, but it's through his daily interactions with the students and staff that prove his title holds much more than officer. Officer Brown is constantly looking at life from a positive point of view. This quality is contagious and rubs off on everyone he comes in contact with. Because Officer Brown is in a constant state of positivity, high schoolers do not instantly dismiss him because of his status as a police officer. This wave of positive energy is especially prominent when he's dancing on the All-Stars dance team. <laughs> All-Stars is a Beaver Creek dance team composed of students with developmental disabilities and peer helpers. Officer Brown is an exceptional addition to the team. Ask any of his fellow All-Stars and they will reply with an abundance of character traits that exemplify him perfectly. Awesome, nice, and helpful are just a few examples of the impersonation he leaves on every student. Officer Brown approaches each individual with an open mind and an open heart, putting aside anything that may set that person apart from others. Officer Brown is never predisposed to believing one side over the other before gathering all facts and sharing all perspectives involved. All of these, American, all of these amazing characteristics intertwine to create a school resource officer that inspires confidence in every single person walking the home. On behalf of the staff, student body, and all-stars, thank you for not only executing your job requirements without fail, but also going the extra mile and providing assistance to anyone in need on a daily basis. Thank you. Officer 
To the students here at Beaver Creek High School, Officer Mark Brown is a friend, confidant, leader, and guardian. And from me, uh, Officer Brown has excellent rapport with both staff and students. He takes time to get to know every student and staff member. Officer Brown understands the importance of building relationships with students and staff outside of the school day. He attends various athletic and extracurricular activities multiple times a week to support our student body. I currently work with Officer Brown on the Safe Schools Committee. He's been the district leader as we implement the ALICE program. His firm, calm demeanor has eased the worries of teachers and, stu and students during this implementation process. Officer Brown's collaborative, compassionate, consistent, and assertive personality has helped to build a safe learning environment for students and a positive working environment for teachers. So on behalf of Beaver Creek High School, we are so grateful to have you. So thank you. Thank you. Sarah. But just watching his interaction with that student, um, I, the first thing I realized is that's the way I want my child to be talked to. So that's what makes Mark so, so special. Um, immediately, that he was somebody that I kind of gravitated to. <coughs> and, uh, I'm telling you, this district, you know, we, it's like we got chips here, because I will tell you, Matt Hickey is an incredible <laughs> individual. Too. It's like we got John and Ponch now. Neither one of them have the hair that John and Ponch have. Uh, I'll let them figure out who John and Ponch is. Um, but I will tell you, Mark is a special guy, and he is, he, him being around kids is the best thing that we can have for our kids. So. Appreciate you very much. Well, I'm going to tell you, seeing that leopard dance outfit last week, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to see that at all. <laughs> yeah, that's only on special occasions. <laughs> no, seriously, thank you guys. I'm totally floored, humbled, honored. Um, I, I don't even know what to say, where to begin. Um, I'm very fortunate. I mean, I have to go back to my roots. Number one, I do take pride in it so much being a Beaver Creek grad myself, going to school here, growing up. I think that's some of the passion and why I do what I do, because I remember what it was like being one of those kids. Uh, you know, my family's here. Thank you, guys. Uh, two of my best buddies in the department, Chris and Matt. Chris, the former SRO, I mean, I watched him do it and learned a lot from him. We've had the program forever, so. I'm just truly honored. Thank you guys. I consider you all family. Thank you very much. Truly honored. Thank you.
No, it really was. No, there was no bean spill. I really bought the whole irate parent thing. I thought it was here to work. I know. All my money was there. All my money was there. All my was there. Um, I think one of the things that I think our students um, 
one of the most important things, you know, we one of the things as a school district, we, we are not allowed to talk to students and say, we want you to vote a certain way or tell your parents to do this. Um, I think what you're doing tonight is perfect. You're getting informed on what's going on and with the situation, with the issue, you're looking at it. Uh, to me, that's what I hope is happening in our homes, that parents are talking about it at the kitchen table, that, parent, that students are trying to grasp that understanding because that's what being a good citizen is all about, um, is understanding what those issues are and how they impact us because uh, $10.4 million, as Mrs. Rucker said, being 13% of a budget, um, this money doesn't bring in anything new, it doesn't buy anything, it doesn't uh, bring in a new program, what it does is just maintains what we're currently doing. Um, so obviously if that goes away, then it, we have to change a lot of those things that we're doing. So I think what you're doing tonight is awesome. It's one of the, what grade are you in? Uh, seventh grade, I'll tell you were like ninth grade, so <laughs> that's good. So, uh, But that's great. I think what you're doing tonight is great, trying to get information, and that's what I would hope other students would do. And another thing is that you wanted to point people to uh, some of the Facebook pages that we have. The school district has a website that has information, and the school district also has a Facebook page that has information, more information on the levy that you could share with others. Is there anyone that has like a different opinion on the levy or anything, or anyone that disagrees with it or? You would see that online. Yeah, Mrs. Rucker and I went to the <coughs> Senior Citizens uh, Center today uh, for lunch with them and discussed uh, the levy uh, publicly and we had a gentleman come up who was pretty adamant that he disagreed with it, but he asked a lot of great questions. We answered his questions, and he was very thankful for that. And so we recognize that um, not everybody's going to have the same perspective or viewpoint on it, and we respect that. All right, that was all I had to ask. Well, Lynn, thank you so much for coming tonight. We appreciate people, especially our students, that want to learn exactly what's going on. <coughs> you know what? An informed person is a really well-educated person, and you can help other people learn about this. So. Thank you very much from all of us on board for coming tonight and taking the time. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay. Um, I need a motion to second to um, approve the approval of the minutes for the September 21st, 2017 regular meeting. So, second. Any discussion? Oh, please. Ms. Arnold? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Ms. Hunt? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Ragone? Yes. Motion carries. And go to Mr. Ryan. Thank you. Uh, we have three items for board discussion tonight. First one is the Green County Career Center Board Membership. Uh, and those documents on page 93, but I've kind of put together a summary for you tonight. Uh, currently, I uh, want to give you a little bit of information about the seat uh, that is expiring here in December. It's a three-year term, and right now, uh, just so everybody knows this, at the Green County Career Center, there are two seats that are open. One is Beaver Creek, and the other one is Xenia. And there is a process for an approval of a candidate, so I kind of want to walk through that with the board so that you're aware of it. As I said, the documents are in your, in your book. Um, candidates must meet all requirements as listed in a questionnaire for prospective members of the board of the Green County Career Center. So I want to give you an idea, a snapshot of what those questions are. Uh, not in great detail because there is literally a paragraph about each one of these, but I kind of summarized them. So these, this is an example of the key components that are on the questionnaire. Item one, this, so this is what a candidate would need to fill out to see if they're eligible to proceed. Item one is general information, which is your, which is a home address, business address, and are they? The, the other question that ties with both those questions is, is it in the territory that is served by Green County Career Center? Uh, question two: details of the business that the prospective candidate serves, such as the employer's name, what's the size of the business, what's the title of the individual, what's the, uh, and what does the organization do? Item three is business experience and how it supports the labor needs in the region. Item four is they're asking for a detail, uh, must be included, so like a resume, uh, what, you've, what you've done. 
Item five, have you served as a member of a joint vocational school district business advisory committee is a question that they ask you to respond to. Um, number six, it's a commitment for appearance at board meetings. And then item seven, the last one, is describe any other relevant experience or perspective that, would, that you would be able to bring to the Green County Career Center. So what other items uh, would that look like? So that is what the questionnaire looks like uh, for the individual that would be filling that out. And then there's a process for appointment. So tonight, we have this as an item for more discussion. We would be bringing this back in November um, as an item for approval. So here's what the process looks like. Candidates who are interested would submit their required questionnaire to the Board of Education. Uh, myself and Dave Deskins with the Green County Career Center, he's the superintendent there, we would review that to determine whether we felt they met all the requirements uh, that were necessary. At the November board meeting, the board would move to approve the resolution approving the MOU between the Green County Career Center and the associate schools. Uh, and that's, that happens with all the schools that are connected to the Green County Career Center. That gets signed by either the superintendent or a board designee. And also at the, board, at the November board meeting, the board will pass a resolution of appointment for the board member to serve on the Green County uh, Career Center. And then following the November board meeting, all materials that are approved and signed will be sent over to the Green County Career Center for them to move forward with that candidate. So I do want to talk about two candidates have voiced interest in this position. One is Al Nels, and Al has served in that capacity for the past two terms. Uh, so he's served in that for the past six years. Uh, Al reached out to me probably four to six weeks ago, um, just to voice that he is still very interested in serving in that capacity and would love to continue on. His current term, as we stated earlier, expires uh, December 31st. Um, so, and, and talking with Dave, obviously Al has done a great job in that position as well. Um, if you'll recall, back in February, we were working with K-12. Uh, we were working with K-12 uh, with the board development, and one of the items that was asked at that time was uh, committee work and uh, service work for the board members. And if you recall, those were sent over to me, um, then we compiled a list. Uh, when you look at the second page, that is the attachment on there. The number one represents the interest, what's your first interest, number two represents your second interest on there. That was communicated to Joanne, um, you can, and I think we went with those committees that were recommended. So I think we moved forward with those, um, and we communicate that through a paddle uh, to the board, because I know the board's been serving on those in that, those capacities. But out of that, uh, Gene Taylor had also communicated back in February that he had interest in serving in that same capacity as well when this seat came available. Um, and so Gene, obviously Gene's been on our board here uh, as well, so this would be a, a new step for, for Gene to do that, but uh, you know, looking at the documentation, I think Gene would be qualified as well to do that. So, so that's what I bring as an item for board discussion, and um, then we would move forward in November to make an appointment. Well, I would just like to share that last night I went to the Green County Career Center Board. Um, Mrs. Harmon and Gina Harmon and I go to that periodically because of the, the advocacy committee, because we've been working with them. And to, but you know, it's one good place where you can catch all the board members from the county, and that's a countywide issue. So, um, and um, I, I, I didn't know that, well, I, I don't know if I knew or remember that you had mentioned it, but. I do just, I'm just going to share what I was told. I was uh, almost accosted <laughs> by um, the various members of the uh, Career Center Board, all of whom asked me to share with you how much they wanted to keep Mr. Nels because he is deeply involved in several of the current initiatives that they've got going on aerospace and, uh, you know, some other things. He is a pilot. He's already met all these criteria, so, you know. Um, and from Mr. Deskins, 
through every last board member talked to me before 9 months and asked me to share that with you guys that um, he's been a very valuable asset to them for the last six years and they would very much like to keep him. So. I'm also at the opportunity to speak to Mr. Deskins um, and over the course of the last couple of years. And I know that he's been very pleased with his relationship with Mr. Nels. Um, I've spoken to some of the other board members at past OSPA conferences and have heard nothing but positive things. Um, and I think something that we as a board need to consider is, you know, as we work with the Green County Career Center or any other entity where we're partnering with something that we maintain a relationship that's positive. And if, if a situation that they have going on is positive and they feel like it's benefiting their district and the career center itself that I think we as a board need to consider that and respect what they feel is working well um, and not disrupt and start from scratch again if, if, if things are going well and it sounds to me from everybody I've heard from that they are. Um, I think that we need to work towards keeping those partnerships strong with the career center. Um, I think that our board is, is blessed or a very lucky, very fortunate situation as we have two individuals who are both very knowledgeable, both very qualified to do the job. A lot of districts don't have that. They're out scrounging trying to find one person that will do that. So I think we're blessed that we have two. The key question for me comes down to um, do we want a sitting member of the board uh, to serve in this capacity or not? That I believe is the key question for I think something that contributes to that, Denny, and now that you mention that, is I know that the Career Center, I've not served in that capacity, but I know that it's a big commitment. I know there's a lot of time involved in that, and you know, more or less depending upon your availability, but I think having somebody not on the board, not that that's always the best answer, but in this particular scenario, I feel Mr. Nels can commit that amount of time and it not take away from other things that we're doing as a district, whereas uh, if one of us were, um, pulled away for that, and maybe there's things that we could be doing here just for our own district that might suffer. So, just something to consider, I guess. Sure. <clears throat> and there are other members of that board that are not on the boards of the, of the group that they serve on. Again, because of the qualification, the need for the qualification. I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. <clears throat> the only point that I want to make is the five of us that are sitting up front right now, right or wrong, were elected by our constituents to represent them. And to me, in my mind, we need to have a sitting board member uh, doing every single thing that we can. If we didn't have someone uh, of, of Gene's capability, then I would say, this is great, let's keep it going. But I, I'm just saying that I believe that we owe it uh, to, our, to our constituents uh, to uh, have someone that is sitting on the board to represent us. Okay. But the rules are clear. It doesn't happen. Oh, that's, that is correct. Well, just, yeah, that let's is not correct. go off too far in that direction without owning the rules. Well, what I see here is we have two qualified candidates, which is great, which is what Denny said. But I do have to agree. <coughs> um, and I want to thank personally in front of everybody, Mr. Nellis, for what you've done for our district. I mean, thank you for the commitment. That was a big commitment to be on the Green County Board. Um, but my feeling is, if you have a sitting board member on this board, this person you can contact right away. The person's going to be in every meeting here every month letting us know what's going on. I'm not saying that's the way it has to be. I'm, this is just my personal opinion. So we have two candidates here that are qualified, and I think we've got a month to think about it, which is why I think is great. And then we come back in November and then discuss it and vote on it. And I think it's fair to both candidates. So yeah, so that what we'll do, uh, as I said earlier, we will bring this back in November for action. Uh, we have to take action in November. We could push it to December, but I, we don't want to do that. So I think November would be where we want to take action. So I will bring this back. So what I will do is I will get the two applications, the two questionnaires. I will meet with Dave Deskins. We, both of us will review it, and I will send those out to the board um, so that you have those uh, to review. And then we'll be working <coughs> with that as an item on the agenda. But once we have that information, then it's easy to you know, and they're both qualified, they're just, they're sure. need to which is great. Like that's why I said, we so in a month, 
all the paperwork will be filled out. We will know and the we'll qualifications of both. And you, to me, you can't make an intelligent decision unless you have the qualifications in your hands. So right now, we don't have all those pieces. Right. So I also think we need to, to discuss the, whether or not um, Mr. Taylor's candidate can vote on that issue, being that he's one of the candidates. I just think that's something we need to find out if that's what's the appropriate What's the appropriate Yeah. Yeah, we can explore that. Sure. I would, my guess would be you can, because when we vote for offices, that person can vote for themselves. But I don't know, I'm just saying. I don't know, a, I don't know that's either, that's what I'm saying. I that's don't. an excellent question. What I'll do, I will explore that, and then I'll give the determination in writing to all five of you. That's good. Thanks. Thank you. All right, item B, I'm going to turn it over to Jason Enix. We'd like to give uh, the board an update on our middle school scheduling meeting that we had last week. Yes, it <coughs> last week. Uh, very productive meeting. And before they get started, I really would like to commend these three individuals sitting here, uh, Darren, Bobby, and Jason. Uh, as you will recall, this has been a... Um, a process that they have worked diligently through for probably the last 10 to 11 months. And uh, Jason and Darren had hair back then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, it's over here. Yeah. So, uh, but, but I will tell you that it, working with the, the staff at the middle school, they were great. I mean, it was outstanding. It was a great, great interaction. Uh, but I also would like to say it was great leadership on the part of these three individuals who really have led the way. So, good evening, everyone. And uh, like Paul said, this is something that we have been working on for, for quite some time now. And you may recall, uh, at one point last last winter, we said we would continue with this work on the middle school scheduling model with an intent to come back in October uh, with some decisions and some direction as we uh, work together with with a, a very substantial committee. And tonight we're going to kind of share the results of that with you. And just to echo what, what Paul had said, we, uh, we really could not have asked for a better group of people to come together and really work uh, really on the best interest of students first, uh, as well as our staff, as well as our buildings, and throughout the district. So we are very pleased with the outcome. And we just want to have an opportunity to share some, some highlights of that with you over these next few minutes. <coughs> Might you help me out there, Mr. Schumann? Right. So our purpose with this uh, with this committee was really to develop a middle school model for the 18-19 school year and beyond. Um, there were a number of different focus items that, that the committee want, really wanted to consider. Uh, those focus items included the amount of instructional time for class periods, uh, the English language arts structure. Uh, encore course requirements as well as elective course offerings, uh, special education requirements, uh, meeting state requirements for course offerings, uh, maintaining student choice, master scheduling implications, and of course staffing implications. And as you can imagine, that is a that's really not an exhaustive list, but that is a, a significant list as we start looking at scheduling um, to really consider all of those items uh, so that so that we could arrive at a conclusion and a model that really does meet the needs of our students and our staff and our, our buildings. Um, very, uh, very lengthy list of things that we were trying to, uh, to really work with. The committee, uh, just to kind of review with you who all was involved, our building leadership teams uh, at each of the buildings at Coy and Ankeny uh, were involved. That was the entirety of the building leadership teams. We also had our building administrators, both principals and assistants, as well as the guidance counselors from both buildings. Um, and then, of course, as, as uh, Mr. Otten said, Darren, Bobby, and myself were, were involved in these meetings throughout. And uh, Mr. Otten was also a part of uh, the, the committee meetings uh, at certain points throughout the, this entire process. Certainly was kept up to speed as we went throughout uh, these last 10, 10, 11 months because, uh, of course, these are significant decisions that were made. And uh, this group <coughs> was, was a very uh, representative group of, of individuals that could come together, both from a teaching standpoint administrative as well as guidance. So again, a very good committee to work with. Next slide, please. Oh, I got it. I'm sorry. This is a brief timeline. I don't want to uh, read through every bit of this, but I do want to highlight a few 
key parts here. Um, we really got together for our first meeting in January um, as we were really identifying what this what the middle school model was going to look like for this school year, the 17-18 school year. And we reconvened, excuse me, we reconvened in March um, to start looking ahead at the 18-19 school year. Uh, there was a lot of work done around the idea of doing research and looking at some best practice models from really our comparable districts as the Ohio Department of Education defines, as well as what is often called kind of our Friday night comparative groups, those that we, we would like to consider ourselves uh, similar to in the local area. So really two different competitive, or two different comparisons to make. And really the, the building leadership team members individually all took um, individual districts or buildings within those districts and contacted them on their own, on their own time, to talk with either counselors, teachers, or administrators to get an idea for what kind of middle school models uh, were really out there that they were working with. And that happened really throughout uh, the spring and into early summer. We did uh, meet uh, in May, uh, just as a kind of wrap up for that last school year. And we got back together on our first uh, professional development day in August just to, again, discuss some of the outcomes of the research that was out there and, and uh, prepare an online survey that our staff did. So all of that really led up to our October 11th meeting. We did have a meeting in September as well, September 14th, that got us kind of set up for our final meeting on October 11th. So really this timeline just lays out for you really about a 10-month time period that our middle school BLT as well as our administrative team was really working uh, together to complete this task. <coughs> Here are the key themes of the research. Um, most of the schools operate on a seven-period day. Currently we have an eight-period day. Uh, at both of our middle schools, and class periods generally ranged in that research from 45 to 50 minutes per class period. Uh, we found that the language arts classes, generally speaking, were blocked for two periods in most of our middle schools, which we are currently doing. Uh, and then there were mixed results on a number of different items, such as whether or not to have an advisory or no advisory, uh, what does the lunchtime uh, look like, what does that structure look like, uh, whether they're teamed or not teamed, what some of the election, elective options look like, uh, and keep in mind that, that some things like lunch times and structure, for example, really have as much to do with facility constraints as they have to do with anything else. Uh, lunch rooms are varying different sizes and there are varying different numbers of students to fit. So it might be a beautiful model to have two lunch periods. Um, for our buildings, particularly at Koi, that's over 500 kids per lunch and that just really doesn't work. So we are limited in some scope there with the number of students that we have as well as our space constraints for putting students into, um, into, into lunch. And so really what, what came out of that was a really good discussion of what some of our comparative districts and buildings are doing. But ultimately, we have our own constraints and we have our own needs. And the committee decided very much that that was great information. But there was no one model out there that was going to fit all of the needs that we had. So it's really important to move forward with what makes sense for our district. I mentioned the staff survey. That happened in <coughs> September, I believe that was on September 12th, at um, building leadership team meetings that were happening separately in both of our buildings. And I ranked these really roughly in, in highest percentage of importance to lowest. Uh, most important to our staff was, was maintaining our staffing levels, uh, as well as increasing instructional time. The language arts block was very important uh, to our staff. And then student choice and electives, as well as the study hall flex style period, was still, I would say, ranked very, very highly in terms of importance, um, but they were less so than the ones previous. But interestingly, the lowest percentage of importance on that survey was that lunch would not interrupt an instruction period, and currently we do have that that takes place in our buildings. So we have a, a uh, instruction period where there is part of a period, and then students go to lunch, and they come back in the last part of the period. It is something I think that has happened for quite some time, and those staff members are and students just kind of used to it, and it's not, it's not terribly unusual, to be very honest, that happens for, for some students, and, and not just obviously here, but others as well. So this was really important work for our, our uh, staff to look at, or ideas for our staff to look at as we start looking at our final model. I would like to personally also acknowledge the work of uh, Mr. Schwederman and Ms. Fiore in, in their efforts, as this is, this is a, a lot of information to kind of digest and, and from a very different perspectives. Before we got to October 11th, there was a significant amount of work done from Mrs. Fiore from the special education side of, of the picture, uh, making sure we met the needs of our, our students and that we were still offering our special needs students 
the same amount of choices and elective options that all of our other students had. That was a key value and really something that we had to do uh, from an equity standpoint. So she worked very closely with her staff to make sure we understood what the ramifications were of uh, special education students in the model. And then uh, Mr. Schwederman, from the HR perspective, uh, he really spent a significant amount of time building what would be a, a model for what the elective structure, I'm sorry, the encore structure would look like. We had had a kind of a working model developed in September that went to trimesters for our encore uh, classes as well as our electives. And so what he set about doing was creating a, a spreadsheet like we would work on for the master scheduling, but doing that right now based on our current numbers of incoming fifth, sixth, and seventh grade students and seeing what trimesters did to our, our course sections and staffing. And that was critical, critical information. Um, to bring to our, our building leadership teams and to share with them, here's what the trimester option looks like for the required on course that we were looking at. And of course, we have all the elective options that we would have. We, we really can't project what students are going to choose right now in October, but this work was really important from the required on course perspective. And it really did allow the staff to have a really good understanding uh, of what trimesters and required on course classes would do to, to the schedule. So, I would like to, again, thank them very much for their efforts to really make this a, a um, full disclosure uh, <coughs> for all of our staff. It was very important, and thank, thank you very much to both of you. The consensus proposal really had some key items here. Uh, the seventh period day was, was reached uh, consensus, plus one study hall flex period. And the idea behind that is that that puts a study period as well as flexible time, as well as tutoring time, and a lot of other factors, a lot of other things that that are important for our kids, for every single student to, to take place. And, and that means that we really are, are taking away kind of study hall as, a, as an elective, because every student's going to have that opportunity. We felt that was a really important part. I should say the staff really felt that was an important part. And really what came down to kind of our final decision making really was centered around that study hall flex period. One of the other key values that the, the staff felt was very important was to maintain language arts block. Um, we really felt that was an important factor for our, our students and our staff that, that we had the two periods of language arts, which encompass both reading and writing. And also, it was important that um, we had required and elective courses offered as either trimesters or year-long courses. And really, the main tenet behind that is that if we made the if we if we put the sixth and seventh grade required on course uh, required on course in sixth and seventh grade, that really opens up the schedule for our eighth grade students to really have more of elective options and not have as much competition between uh, varying different programs. And it really did allow for our eighth grade students to have more, op more options, much like they might have as they transition to high school. And again, that was a value that felt, the committee felt was, was very, very important. So those are some, some of the key ideas. I'm going to uh, show you this next slide. And, and I, I, I know that this is a lot here. I'm going to summarize this for you. This is what really the sixth, seventh, eighth grade elective and encore options look like. Uh, over in the sixth grade, we, the committee uh, decided that health, art, and digital media technology would be kind of a required on course. Uh, again, these are in trimester formats, so 12 weeks each. And then having electives, uh, full year of band choir, as well as PE, world language design thinking, and our electives. Uh, these are not in detail yet. I'll get to that in just a minute as to why. Uh, if you look at seventh grade, uh, the required on uh, classes for the automation and robotics course that we are currently offering in eighth grade. For our, uh, for our students, These are, this is the uh, Green County Career Center course. Um, it is a required course for seventh grade as well as, well as PE. And then they have one additional elective option uh, for that trimester. And then you can see the list of, of electives below that, including uh, the app creators and uh, it's called CSEM, I know, not computer science or computer makers, I think is what that stands for. But that is currently part of our semester course that it's called um, uh, app design. Currently, are in our eighth grade, or I'm sorry, it's an elective. And then in eighth grade, there are no required encore courses, which means that our students really have two full periods of electives. That allows them to choose full year of band required as well as a full year of what language they choose, or they have options for multiple trimesters. Uh, it gives the students uh, more choices um, and allows them to, to make some decisions that they really have an interest in after having gotten that middle school style experience of having the same type of courses. Uh, I'd like to kind of just mention this too, and, and it really gets to our, our next slide of our, our next steps. Really key to this whole idea, if you recall, we talked last year about a master scheduling process. 
uh, what we've really considered as a year-long process. We are in the midst right now of finalizing or getting ready to finalize our program of studies by the end of this calendar year to bring to you for a January adoption. Uh, what that means is we have a lot of work to do to get encore courses as well as all of our required courses and electives all in program of studies, which really gets to the first bullet point here for our next steps. Uh, the, curr the curriculum department will be providing the lease time for all of our departments uh, that are affected by this. All of our encore classes are going to be shifting from uh, semester to trimester. And so that's going to require some, some curriculum work, as well as looking at what the elective options are. You may have seen up there, for example, art electives. Um, what, what are those going to end up being? We currently have just a semester of art. So what are the art electives going to look like? We're going to work through that with our, both all the art teachers by providing some release time. We're going to really look at designing what those art electives are going to look like. And we're going to do that with all of our departments between now and uh, planning <coughs> between now and the middle of the uh, And so that all of our teachers that are working in those areas will have collaboration time to work together in both buildings to develop those courses and write program descriptions as well as start looking at what that might look like. So that's, that's that is, a question. Mark. Yes, absolutely. And you may address this later, so I'm sorry yeah, sure. if you are, but how does what does that do to if you're doing trimesters, what does that do for like grading periods and things like that? I mean is that going to be addressed later in here? That that will be uh, not in this not in this presentation. I know that uh, I have been working with Mr. Schumann, he's aware of that. He's already starting to work with his team with the technology department looking at uh, with Rebecca, and that there are some models that are out there in terms of how trimesters work in progress book, and Mike, you may want to um, bring there are districts doing this where they have full year quarter classes and full year trimester classes, and it's worked out how it works in the grade book and how report cards come out. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we have some models that we're we'll looking at. <coughs> so once those are all determined, we'll, we'll get the program of studies uh, completed for both middle schools and young high school, as well as Ferguson Hall. Uh, we'll submit those for uh, board approval in, in January. Uh, we are going to be uh, working with BEA as this was a negotiated item through uh, our negotiation process last year. So we're setting an interim uh, with members of the association to uh, redo some language around the middle school schedule. That is uh, in the works here the next month. And then building leadership teams are going to be finalizing the expectations and procedures for what that study hall flex period looks like. We did leave that somewhat open-ended in that um, this, the concept of study hall flex was in place but it was not in the scope of this committee to really determine the finality of that. So the building leadership teams under the direction of the building principals will look at kind of deciding that what are some of the um, parameters that we're going to place on what study hall flex looks like in terms of uh, daily usage. So they, that will be continued work here throughout the rest of the year. And then finally, um, our building and district administration will continue to work on the master scheduling process um, for 2018-2019. That process is already underway. We've already had our first meeting of the year uh, looking at kind of big picture timelines and what our, our next steps are. And right now we're in that, in that finalization process of the program of studies. And I would say that, not that we're close to having a final product, but between now and really the end of uh, December, we, we should have that in place and ready to go in January. And that's, again, a really key component so we can get ready for uh, student course requests and scheduling in, in February. So, um, again, wanted to give the board a Another uh, update as we uh, committed to that last winter. Uh, we could not really be happier with how the building leadership teams from both buildings came together, worked together, uh, developed, I think, a really good sense of, of uh, collaboration and community within that, that group. Um, we, we had some very great discussions and some really good work that's happened and people came up with a really great model. And uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Like I had one. Um on the slide where you showed the different options by grade level, yes. um, I noticed that under eighth grade, PE is not an elective option. Is that just omitted <coughs> accidentally, or is that accurate? Uh, that would have been an accidental. Okay. Uh, that should be there, because what we, have, what we anticipate as we work with our departments uh, <coughs> is that we'll be developing options for those students, course options. And, and really, a lot of those may be co-seated from the standpoint of having seven and eighth grade students in the same course. Uh, sixth and seventh grade students may be in the same courses, but never sixth and eighth. So uh, that's that. All what that does is it opens up opens up options for our kids. That we, as well as from the scheduling standpoint, we we just go to the class in the same single singleton. Uh, singletons are tough to get with in a, a schedule. So 
allowing some and eight grades of continue to be in the same course of PE being one of those. And I apologize for getting that, but we certainly was, was planned to have that in place. Have an incoming eighth grader next year, so I just wanted to know what was, who was there. Yeah, I believe I know the answer, and I want to, I want to clarify and make sure our middle school students will have the opportunity as middle school students to earn high school credit in a foreign language. Correct. I, I really am pleased with the the choices that we're giving these kids because <coughs> by the time they get to high school, you know, the idea of choices, I've seen some overwhelmed kids trying to figure out that this is really going to help them as they move through the system. You know, I very much like that, that we were walking away from all of the required well, we think there's a good transition here with our sixth grade students having one period of choice in the um, It gets a little bit more for seventh grade students and certainly greater choices for eighth grade. And again, ideally in a middle school like concept, students are, are being exposed to a lot of different things. And as they, they, as they grow and mature and they're able to make more decisions, they'll, they'll, have those, they'll have more options as, as eighth grade students. I think one of the key components of the schedule that does allow for that flexibility even more so than what we have this year is that that study hall flex period is in place for all of our students. That really opens up the fact that we have two periods of electives, let's say for eighth grade, but one of those is not a study hall. So the students are likely to need to have or have to have <coughs> after school activities, sports teams, clubs, those types of things. Understandably so. Uh, but again, every student will have that next year and still have two full periods of life to change. I will tell you, I've had several parents getting ready to the Kroger's, that's the place, <laughs> come up to me and thank school system for, you know, the choices that the kids are having. I had a grandparent go up to the women's league and she came up to me after the last meeting and thanked the school board and I said, well, you know, you have to thank the people who put this together. And she said, my grandson is just having a ball in robotics. She said, who would have ever thought? So people are loving this. I want to thank all of you for giving our kids this opportunity because that's what it's all about. If we're not out for our kids, then why are we here? So I can't even begin to imagine the work that's put into this. You Nobody could unless you're in your shoes. So thank you very much for all the work you're doing for our kids because they're our little beavers. Really, that's what they are. I know we get called all my little beavers, but thank you because the, our kids deserve this. Um, and thank you for that, but I'm going to also deflect a lot of that to our staff. <laughs> that's what I said. Everybody sitting here. The that's staff that's not in this room and right now. And whatever um, involved, they were please share this with them because it is so appreciated. You know, sometimes you know you're all the good. And when people come up to the progress, and I guess that's the meeting place, you know. But when a grandparent comes up to you, that really was. That was the best. So yes, yeah, so one other. You. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. One other question. The world language. Yes. Is it maintaining the same thing that they do now, as far as exploratory six that's and seven? That's a great question, and that's not determined yet, okay. um, because again, it's going to be one of the departments that we're going to meet with <coughs> and have them do some some work about crafting what really is the next steps for world language going forward. There's a new there's a model that's in place for this year. We understand that that's there are some pros and cons to that. Um, but this will be an opportunity for the World Language Department to come together and really vision what's next and, and what is, is um, what they believe is they're the ones in the classroom with kids, what would be a good model for our world languages going forward. Um, again, pros and cons to really every decision that's made, but we want to get those folks in the same room and be thinking about what, uh, what is a good model for our world languages going forward. So I can't, I can't say that for certain right now because that does not Sorry, I have a vested interest no, in that I one, so I, I got to ask some questions on the middle school. I think oftentimes uh, in the past, uh, staff has not felt like they were stakeholders uh, in the process. And I want to thank you for giving them the opportunity to, to do that. Because it's a, it shows the expectation <coughs> of you, you guys, in terms of wanting them to have a voice in, in the things that they uh, have taught. There are no questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, and our last item for board discussion uh, is item C, Miami Valley Hospital contract agreements. Uh, typically, I do not like doing this, uh, but I'm also asking the board tonight for approval on this. Uh, here's why. Uh, Mr. Thompson has been working with Miami Valley Hospital on this contract agreement for months and uh, really was initiated in the beginning of October. And um, this is a contract that we've always maintained. So there's really no changes in that contract. It, it, they provide our uh, services, uh, athletic training services. They also provide a, a nice donation to the school district of $130,000. Um, I will tell you that there's also another side of that contract that we pay them $30,000 for those services as well because we're such a large district. So we're basically getting $100,000 from Miami Valley Hospital. So they, we signed off on that. Those came two days ago, and uh, we could wait till November. But I felt since there was really no changes, and Mr. Thompson did run this past legal, and there was some language that we asked to be changed in terms of hold harmless for the school district, which obviously protects the school district, uh, that they very willingly changed pretty promptly and sent that right back. So. Um, that's really it. It's, it's no, nothing new, nothing changes. We're not losing anything. We're not gaining anything. We're just continuing on with a five-year relationship similar to what we've done in the past. Um, so we're going to ask the board tonight to approve that as well. So is there any questions at all about that? No, it's part of our uh, Miami Valley Hospital. Right. I, I do have a question because approximately 10 years ago when this agreement was put in place, it was on a $30,000 agreement. 10 years with a 10-year clause that could be extended and when we worked on that the idea was we put in the artificial turf we put in the all uh, all weather behind track and the belief was that the turf was going to last approximately 10 years and this money then would continue right. to uh, allow us to upgrade and I have never heard anything about a five-year contract but I believe there is a 10-year extension we, do you want to talk about that? Uh, in the contracts in here, it is labeled as an add-on optional. Okay. Mm -hmm. the additional so it was an additional five, and then we have that again for another ten after this one. Okay. So when this five okay. years okay. is up, there's so another ten. Okay, so we have a five-year plus ten. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will tell you, when we sat down months ago, uh, they, uh, Miami Valley was looking at this to become a three-year deal because um, they were scaling back and then kind of at the 11th hour they said no we're going to go back with the original of what we were doing so and Mr. Morrison you are absolutely correct we see this money doing the exact same thing because I think we're on year eight of the field and uh, obviously we're going to have to make it through this season but I'm not sure if we'll make it through next season. So. Great so um, we're going to ask the board for approval of that later on tonight on your okay. agenda that it falls under item yeah, four Okay, so that concludes items for board discussion. Okay. So I'm going to need a motion to second to approve um, the October 2017 five-year forecast, September 2017 financial reports, September 2017 donated items, and the updated fiscal year 18 school fees for Coy Middle School. So moved. Second. Discussion. <coughs> to our peers and the state averages. Uh, the district, as far as revenue per pupil, we are below the peer averages. That's our peer districts and our similar districts, because Ohio 
just to remind you that the Ohio Department of Education compares us based on our characteristics of our district and demographics. They compare us to 20 similar districts. And then we choose our peer averages, which are basically the districts around us that we chose. And then there's our information. So I'm um, going to talk a little bit about how our revenues work and how we function as a district in our demographic. The revenue versus expenditure um, graph that you have here, it shows that without this new levy, without this renewal of this levy, um, we are looking at a funding cliff in the green line. The uh, red line is our expenditures that keep moving up, and then the blue line um, does go down as our revenues if we do not uh, pass the levy. If um, batteries on this thing, I don't know. Um, so if we do pass the levy, we still have a negative cash balance in fiscal year 20. So for right now, what it's looking like in our revenue plan is we need to pass this um, substitute emergency levy that we're doing in November. And then we also have a permanent improvement levy that's not going to be reflected in the five-year forecast because it's a general fund re reflection. But at, and that will be in May, we will need to um, approve our five-year permanent improvement levy. And then in the following November, as you can tell, because we have a funding cliff going on, we're going to need new money. So that's pretty much what we've talked about since about a year and a half ago when K-12 came out and talked to us about what our revenue structure looked like and how we were really flat funded, but you know we're not keeping pace with um, our expenditures and our revenues. Our ending cash balances, again, you can see <coughs> we start going down um, in years um, 21 and 22 for sure. Uh, if you look at the orange line on this graph, you're going to see the 60-day cash ratio. We really try to keep a 60-day balance. And fiscal year 19, I want to point out that um, we are starting to go below the line. Um, and in fiscal 20, we start having a small deficit. Um, if we come in under budget or under projections, I, I pretty much think that we'll be OK in 19 and 20. I think that we'll probably be, um, we'll meet our targets. But I, in, in 21, but in 20, even if we're not deficit in 20, we're still not going to meet the 60-day cash ratio. So we're still looking at, in a couple of years, having, having a, a funding deficit. And the problem here is, and I'll talk about it later, and at some point, we'll probably want to do a workshop where we pull up the five-year forecast, and I really start showing you scenarios of how much millage we can run in the five-year forecast and then what that does in the long run. It's kind of like what we do in negotiations. We put the five-year up there and we run all types of different scenarios on you know, what the options are for negotiating. But we will want to do that so that we can all agree on where we need to go in November of next year as far as the millage. But the sooner you start passing a levy, the lower the millage can be because you'll have a little bit of reserves to carry you out for five years or six years or however many years you want to do that. And typically, we start out with the emergency levy and then what we're at our financial plan is to start with the emergency levies and then turn them into substitute emergency levies. That would be permanent. But um, that's, that's our plan. So you can see very clearly the funding clip. Our tax year 16 values, we went up about 2.41% overall in our tax rates for the district. Help me, Mike. <laughs> okay, it went. Um, our average daily membership for the district, um, we're staying pretty steady. I mean, we've had some bumps in the road, but we're above our similar districts. Our local revenue per pupil, our local revenue, now, now you know we're 75% locally funded because it's a wealthy district in comparison to the majority of districts in the state. Uh, Beaver Creek, we are spending about $8,000. We're getting about $8,000 
in revenue per pupil. Then the revenues um, here that come from the state, 25% of our revenues come from the state, and the rest is locally funded. I mean, that's, that's what we have to do. The state revenue per pupil, in our 20 similar districts of the state, we're at the bottom quartile. We get a very small share of the state funds. And our federal revenue, that's the 20 similar. Again, we're in the lower portions of how much money we get in the federal uh, support in our peer districts, bottom quartile. So we're heavily locally funded, and this is why. We have a high median resident income. <coughs> Along with that, we have higher home values. So with those two um, characteristics, that tells you that uh, we are a, a wealthier district. So the state will only subsidize us to a certain point. The uh, number of students served, 7,258, that was in 16. That's gone up, like we hear that that's gone up about 70 kids, but you know, we're, we're still managing uh, based on last year's numbers. Now, based on the new biennial budget, we've been on the formula, we've been on the state formula. We can be a cap district, a formula district, or a guarantee district. Cap district means the formula is bringing in more money than the state really wants to give you, so they cap you. The formula district says you put all the variables in, like 400 and some variables, and you're going to get the formula and not the money. The guarantee says the formula isn't working for you. You're not getting as much money as you <coughs> should be getting or in the prior years, and it would be a real detriment to you, so they guarantee you a certain amount of money. So the cap and the guarantee are like the guardrails. The formula is if the formula is really working for you. We have been on the formula for the past two years. Now we're going to a capped district, which means the formula says we should be bringing in more money or the state would owe us more money than what um, they're willing to pay us. So they've capped us. Um, next year we're about into the cap of about one and a half million and it goes to about 700,000 and then it goes on to about 200,000 and then we go back on the formula. So, you know, we just keep looking at the district. Um, dynamics. <clears throat> the problem with the state funding formula and the reason that this we keep fluctuating back and forth between the cap and the formula is because of not only our own demographic changes but how we react with respect to the rest of the state. So they have different formula pieces in this um, state, what they call the SSI, and they say well how are you doing? Are you getting richer or poorer with respect to different variables within <coughs> other districts in the state? We got a little bit poorer with respect to the other districts, so they put us on the cap, and we got a little bit more state funding than what we had anticipated. So that's just something that most recently happened. Everything else has been the same. Nothing else has changed as far as what we worked on in May. Uh, in May. Everything else is just the same. Um, our expenditures, still 82% of our budget, and um, we neg our negotiated agreement, we stayed within the five-year forecast, so that didn't change either. Go ahead. Um, expenditures per pupil were still low compared to our similar districts and the peer average. I mean, I think this is a, a message that needs to get out there as far as when we have to go after new money, especially, is that you know, our expenditure per pupil is really low. Um, the students per teacher, we have one of the highest in the similar averages and in the peer average. And even the Ohio's average, we have the higher students per teacher in the classroom. So, I mean, again, it shows that we are doing a lot of less. Uh, our average teacher salary, compared to our 20 similar districts, we're in the the lower range. We're at 64, 777, and, and um, even in the peer group, you can see, you know, we are not out of alignment. Even with, you know, our our new negotiated agreement, we stayed right at what everybody else is doing. Um, our expenditures are increasing, but mainly again, salaries and benefits, which is 
what happens in the service heavy industry. Our 2016 expenditures per pupil, $10.7,000. We're at the very bottom. I mean, we are in the last quartile of, the, of our 20 districts and you know, right in the middle to the low of our, our peer groups. I mean, we are still, again, it, it speaks to how low we are, are spending. Our <coughs> administrative costs, which is something that people don't, you know, they want to put the money in the classroom, and we do too. That's why our administrative costs are very low. We were in the last and the lowest quartile in our in our 20 similar districts, and we're still low even when compared to our peers. Uh, our current operating level levels would have to be required. I mean, um, we're speaking to all the levies that we have coming up. I mean, we all know if we don't pass these levies, this is our revenue. We're going to have to make some large changes if you know um, we don't get the funding we need, and we can't go to the state can't go to the feds, we're forced to go to the local taxpayer. If we look at our results, our taxpayers are getting a pretty good bang for the buck because our four-year graduation rate is at the top, the ACT, we're at the top of the ACT percentile compared to all of our peer groups in similar districts, so uh, we have a good story. We have a good story, it shows that, you know, we have the, the, the money that we get is based on our wealth. It comes in at the local level. We're given results. We're having low administrative costs. We have low expenditures per pupil. We have high, um, you know, students and the numbers of students in the classroom, which isn't necessarily a great thing as far as education is concerned, but financially speaking, <coughs> it's conservative. So, um, we have a good, we're, we're poised, and these are all indicators that would say you're ready for new money. You're in need. Our performance index, again, we have a great performance index when compared to other districts. And that's my report, and I would take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Excellent presentation. So uh, definitely very much appreciated. A couple of things jumped out to me uh, that I'd like to share. First of all, um, and you mentioned it briefly, uh, and I think it's really important that we mention again our expenditure per pupil is near the lowest, okay, which is obviously definitely where we want to be. I, what, I, what I think we really need to make sure gets out there as well is that our percentage of revenues that we're spending on classroom instruction is either the highest or near the highest in Green County. And we need to tout that, that we're putting our money where our mouth is, it's going into, into classroom instruction. So I think that's phenomenal. Uh, the other thing that jumps out at me, and I definitely want to uh, congratulate Peg, and I want to thank her with the advocacy group, because right now when I see we're giving $3 million annually to school choice, and significant dollars that a John Peterson scholarship, those both ruffle my feathers, and anything we can do to stop those, we need to. So thank you.
coming in and asking approval, but we felt this was something we should move on. That concludes new business items for board action. Okay. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Ms. Arnold? Yes. Ms. Hunt? Yes. Mr. Goddard? Yes. Motion carries. Good afternoon. So there's no school in the grade. The conference is October 20th and 27th. <coughs> Election day is November 7th. Get out and vote. It's all right. Um, Board of Education meeting the next one is November 16th. Right here in this room. And we're on to board comments. We'll start with Star. Oh. Um, I'm really busy. I'm, um, I'm in training all months to be a uh, child advocate um, CASA slash guardian of Lighting for um, Green County little children. Um, the Green County courts are overwhelmed with children that are being born addicted to opioids and um, they can use all the help they can get. So if anybody else is interested in volunteering to um, advocate on behalf of the children. You don't have to fight with parents, you know, <coughs> but um, it, it requires some um, interviewing the child. And, um, this is more of a one-on-one -on -one thing than the whole school district, but, um, you know, I, uh, having raised two of my own grandchildren and having had to fight the court system tooth and nail with a guardian ad litem who never even met the kids, I kind of made a vow to myself one day I would do that, and my grandkids are all excited about it. Drew wants to do it too. So that's really nice. You know, not, not exactly that. school nice. news, but I'm exhausted. Well, that, that. <laughs> I have to be in the court all day long, mm, wow. training mm. nine, seven, uh, eight. How four. long is the training? It started in the <coughs> October, and it's been like three hours Tuesday and Thursday. Oh, wow. And then a full day every other week, plus three hours of volunteer time. Oh, okay. It's, uh, yeah. It's tense. Yeah. He's like, he's. Thanks for doing that. No, really, that's one thing. Yeah, I wish I would like to beg all the rest of you to do it, too. That's mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Mr. Taylor. Okay, uh, just two things for me. I think that, again, tonight we saw uh, what a great job that Beaver Creek does in selecting uh, critical staff. Uh, Mark Brown, of course, the recognition for him just shows that uh, we have a knack for that, and it is what brings, those types of actions are what bring people to be great. Uh, just driving around the neighborhood and all the new housing, uh, and the sign to go with that, the big selling point, Beaver Creek Schools. Yeah, we're listed, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, it's good, big red letters. Uh, the, the second thing is, uh, I was uh, selected as president of Beaver Creek Kiwanis, and uh, we spent a lot of time uh, developing programs for kids of Beaver Creek. Uh, the four programs that uh, we spent most of our time with is uh, Shoes for the Shoeless, uh, <coughs> Feed the Creek, uh, the high school band, uh, supporting them, and this year we sponsored a teacher to uh, Space Camp. And uh, so uh, those types of things are always looking for opportunities to help kids out uh, that may have a little bit more difficulty in making it through life. So uh, our fundraising arm for that uh, big thing happened this uh, last Thursday was our silent auction. Uh, we had uh, about 100 or so people there, lots of items, great deals, <coughs> lots of fun. So. Uh, supporting our uh, support organizations out there, wh whatever they may be. I think at any capacity, and the uh, same with you on that page, uh, is, is important because it adds to the fabric of what we Creek is. That's what I have to oh, say. Oh, first of all, congratulations on being president. <laughs> or my wife would say, what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I'm all proud of you. That's great. Congratulations, Jim. Oh, <laughs> this is how I feel about the um, I just wanted to add on about Mark Brown. Uh, my husband's in law enforcement, so he had worked with Mark Brown years ago, and so I'd had opportunity to know him for many years. And he, my husband worked for the Green County Prosecutor's Office uh, several years ago, and Mark's always been that kind of person, like to reach out and just develop such 
strong partnerships with people, so it's no surprise to me that he's doing that with kids at our school. I mean, I, you know, not all of us Friday night football games and seeing all those kids come up and high five them. I mean, that did not happen in high school to our SRO. I can never remember that. That's, he wasn't the cool guy that everybody wanted to be friends with, so I think that speaks volumes to Mark and the job those guys are doing. I saw Matt Hickey today as I was picking up my daughter at Ankeny. He's out waving the buses. And it's just a lot different than when I was in schools. These guys are pretty awesome. Um, and then I just wanted to personally thank, from a parent perspective, um, the staff at Ankeny, my daughter and I are going to be taking a missions trip in January. It's going to take her out of school for a week, um, obviously. So, you know, she's missing a lot of work. But um, I was really impressed with the amount of support I received from the staff there. Um, you know, committed, <coughs> excited for us, um, committed to help her, you know, make sure she doesn't get behind on all those things, but just excited for her to have an opportunity outside the classroom. And, I'm glad that our teachers see the value in those things as well as what goes on inside the classroom. So um, just appreciate that that's the kind of district we're going to take for those women. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to congratulate, uh, first of all, uh, Ms. Rodden, as well as uh, Joanne and Krista. Uh, they are the Women's League, and they made excellent presentations on the ballot issue and on the campaign. So phenomenal job to both of you. And I'd also like to say that you know, we're very proud of Beaver Creek because we are dealing with the entire child. And no matter what your interests are, we have something for you uh, here at Beaver Creek. And we always talk about academics, and obviously that's why we have schools, so that, that's most important. But our other programs, our athletic programs, our music programs, everything else that we have is top notch. So congratulations to everyone. And that's a great segue into me. Because today, um, we probably have not talked to the your email, but you and I received an email from, I want to read this letter to you because this says a whole lot about our school system. It's from the Mammon family, and they're in Israel now, and it says, My name is Yuri Mammon. I served as the Israeli foreign liaison officer at Wright Patterson Air Force Base for the last two years. I arrived with my wife and our four kids. Our kids were part of the education system of Beaver Creek City School District, Parkwood Elementary School, and Ankeny Middle School. Leaving your own country, friends, and family, and arriving to a new country with a new language and a culture is a challenging process. Fortunately, in big bold letters, we found an amazing education system and wonderful staff at the schools. Since the first meeting at school, the staff was supportive, professional, and kind. They let our kids feel safe and comfortable. Every problem or challenge they had was answered. The SL lessons were very helpful, and the teachers did everything they could in order to make sure that English language would not be an obstacle for our kids. Mr. Dale Wren and Ms. Susan Sanford <coughs> kindly helped and supported us. Our request always found a listening ear. Their leadership is a great asset for the district. Unfortunately, I cannot mention all the teachers, counselors, and staff. They were all great. I am writing this letter from Israel, and our kids still talk about the great experience they had at school. Please forward our appreciation and big thanks to all of those who supported and helped and are inspiring today, preparing for tomorrow. It will be our pleasure and honor to host you here in Israel. And it's signed, very respectfully, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Yuri Namini. So that is just Everybody had to hear that. It made me cry when I read it today. So, to all of you, this goes to everybody sitting out here. Thank you, people, for what you do for our school system because obviously it's well appreciated. And to get it from Israel, I will be sending him a letter in return. And I will forward it to all of you, but he deserves that. My husband reading to him, Charlie's just sitting there and said, and the, the tears are coming to Charlie goes, This is amazing. It was. So it says a lot for our school district. Somebody to take the time from Israel and write to us. He didn't have to do that. So thank all of you. Amazing district. So and <laughs> 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 okay. So moved, and that's it. <laughs>